I'm not the speaker you may have expected. This should have been Markus talk. So Markus Frems, who is uh, listening in, who is actually in Oxford, but unfortunately he cannot give this talk. Um, uh, so a bit last minute, I um, agreed to uh, substitute for him. Um, these are his slides also. Uh, so, um, and it's fair to say that um, it's joint work, but Markus is the first author on this. So this is all based on a paper that you can find in the archive um, of the same title. Um, what is this about? Um, well, we look at um, quantum correlations, and of course we know from Bell's theorem that they are stronger than uh, quantum uh, classical correlations uh, in general. Uh, and the immediate problem is to characterize um, quantum correlations, and we'll focus on the bipartite case here. Um, there's quite a bit of literature suggesting different physical criteria to single out quantum correlations. Um, some keywords are information causality by Pawlowski and co-authors, macroscopic locality, Navasquez and Wunderlich, local orthogonality by Fritz and uh, others, and a few more things, for example, by Popescu. Um, but it's fair to say that this is not really conclusive. Um, and for example, there are these almost quantum correlations, Navasquez and co authors 2015. The references are given at the end. There are some slides towards the end. Uh, and you get a handout if you like or can download this. Um, so you can look up all the details there. Um, so our goal is still to characterize bipartite quantum states and um, one slide to give you an overview is here. Um, of course, there's something we cannot understand at this point, but uh, it should give the idea where I want to go. So we have to look at which observables are we considering, um, which constraints do we put on them and what does this give us in terms of the state space. And what is marked out here is already the solution. Um, and of course, I'll explain what these things mean and how we single out quantum states um, in this way. Right. Um, we start from something that you're all very familiar with, uh, no signaling. Um, uh, so just to fix the notation, I write mu of AB, AB uh, as a joint probability distribution for some local observables A and B, and big A, big B are the outcomes, of course. And then you could demand uh, what is called local causality, um, namely that your probability distribution factorizes in this nice way. Classical correlations are of that kind, they are factorizable, but as we all know, quantum correlations are not in general. Um, so we can still demand something weaker, which is called no signaling, and these are these two conditions. So the probability of getting outcome big A uh, for observable A is this sum over the outcomes B on the uh, second um, uh, observable, um, and likewise uh, the probability of getting outcome big B for observable little b is the sum over these outcomes A. Okay, um, this hopefully is familiar, and then you also know that this in turn is not enough to single out quantum correlations. You can get stronger correlations from this, um, for example, PR boxes. But what we observe already here is that you no know, signaling, of course, depends on the set of local observables, uh, little a, little b, that we consider. And one thing you can do um, that has been done before in the literature is to say, okay, locally, Alice and Bob, they each have quantum observables. So um, this is what we assume from now on. Um, observables are locally quantum. This means my little a comes from the bounded self adjoint operators on some Hilbert space H1, and B comes from self adjoint operators on H2. I said bounded, but here everything is actually finite dimensional, so self adjoint is enough, everything is bounded. There's this theorem here, <coughs> it's been quite old by now, uh, by Clay, Randall, and Faulis. And um, you can also look at Wallach 2002. It says the following if you have two 
finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, H1, H2, both are at least three dimensional. Then you have a one to one correspondence between joint probability distributions um, with these locally quantum observables, um, satisfying no signaling constraints and so called POPT states. Um, so we write them sigma mu of a, b, and this is indeed given as trace rho mu a tensor b. So what are these POPT states? Um, they are linear operators on the tensor product Hilbert space, as you might expect. They have trace one. And if you put in positive uh, A and positive B, then indeed you get some uh, positive number. So they are positive on positive tensors. This is POPT. But they are not positive in general, if you put in um, some arbitrary um, self adjoint operator here uh, on this uh, Hilbert space, it's not necessarily the case um, that you get a positive number. So what is known, and that's an interesting result by Barnum and, and uh, others, that um, POPT correlations are no stronger than quantum correlations. So the task that we now have is to see how can we guarantee that such a POPT state is positive, uh, hence a proper quantum state. So this is exactly the problem written down here again. And we go back to our overview and basically start here in the upper left corner from no signaling, we get POPT states. So the next step is to slightly uh, generalize no signaling to something that's called no disturbance. Here we introduce um, a new notation and a little bit of new thinking. Um, by V of H, we denote the collection of all commutative subalgebras, um, which you can call contexts if you like of our algebra of observables. And we keep track of how they're contained within each other. So we order them by inclusion. This gives a nice partially ordered set. And like every post said, that is a category in a, in a simple way. And this is what we call the context category. It turns out that this is a rather useful thing. And I don't know if anyone is around, but, but um, people may be familiar with um, some work by Aisham and me from, from a while ago. Um, this idea was used there already a lot. And there's a recent paper um, that Marx and I wrote, which is now accepted uh, for JMP. And this shows how much you can actually do with this structure, with this context category. Uh, what we want to do with it um, will become clear in a minute. Um, first of all, observables in the same context are exactly those that you can measure uh, jointly in any quantum state. Now, um, we want to talk about no disturbance related to such contexts, and it's a simple idea. Consider three contexts, V tilde, V and V prime, such that V tilde is contained both in V and V prime. And then our probability uh, distribution, uh, we can look at it context by context, and we can, for example, look at it in context V prime and restrict it to the smaller context V tilde. And we demand that this is what we already have if we just look at um, the smaller context. And likewise, if you restrict from the bigger context V down to V tilde, it's also supposed to, to be what we already have at V tilde. Now, this restriction is nothing but marginalization. So we have these marginalization conditions between contexts. And of course, you can immediately interpret this as non-contextuality conditions. And this means we get um, a probability distribution mu that is now given as this bunch of, of things defined in context, but uh, these conditions guarantee if a projection is contained in different contexts, it's always assigned the same probability. So this is a non-contextuality condition in this sense. Right. 
Now, um, this is no disturbance for context, but now we want to look at composite systems. So our contexts V are of a particular form. They are pairs of contexts, V1, V2. V1 is context of the first uh, subsystem and V2, one of the second subsystem. Then we play the same game as before. We have three contexts, V1 tilde, which is contained in V1 and V1 prime. And similarly, V2 tilde contained in V2 and V2 prime. And we demand that these things hold, we can either restrict in the first slot, um, so from uh, V1 to V1 tilde, um, and likewise from V1 prime to V1 tilde. And this gives us this guy in the middle, and here in this first line, V2 is the same throughout, so we don't do anything in the second slot. Second line, of course, is restricting in the second slot. Um, if our probability distribution fulfills all these conditions, uh, then we say it has no disturbance for product contexts. How does this relate to no signaling? Well, actually, in a very simple way, um, instead of picking some arbitrary smaller context V tilde, we just pick the trivial context, which is just multiples of the identity. And then uh, these are these conditions written down for the trivial context here first subsystem here of the second one. So in this way, no disturbance is slightly stronger than no signaling. Um, okay. Um, what does this give us? Well, if you look at this theorem already cited by Clay and, and others, um, they implicitly used no disturbance already. Um, so um, we are still at the level of POPT states. This does not help us yet uh, so much. So we need a bit more um, to restrict further. Um, but interestingly, you can observe if you have a single system, not a composite system, then no disturbance is exactly the kind of conditions you need um, for Gleason's theorem. Uh, so if you have um, a probability distribution um, for a single system and it uh, fulfills no disturbance, you know it comes from a quantum state already by Gleason's theorem. Okay, um, now comes an interesting move. So you all know Choi Jamakovsky, and um, the key observation here is if you go from a POPT state by Choi Jamakovsky, you get um, a channel that is positive. But if you start from a positive POPT state, which is a proper quantum state, then by Trojankovsky, you get a completely positive channel. So our task will be to, uh, to characterize these completely positive channels. Um, now we rewrite slightly what we have before uh, using um, this and it's easy to observe um, that for every context of the first subsystem, you get a POVM um, in this way. So it's E mu V1 goes from projections in this context V1 to the positive operators uh, on the second um, Hilbert space. How does this work? Well, basically, as you would expect, you define the POVM in this way. Um, and there's a little result that actually makes use of Gleason's theorem. Um, this PVM extends to a positive linear map phi mu from um, the, the operators on H1 to the operators on H2. Right. The move we want to make is actually um, going from these POVMs to PVMs um, because then another theorem becomes applicable and uh, this seems to be necessary to characterize quantum states. So it's not just artificial here. Um, you all know Nymark's theorem, I don't know if you have to read this, so just to fix the notation, if you start from such a POVM, there's a larger Hilbert space K, linear map V from H2 to K, so we enlarge the second Hilbert space here, and a projection valued measure phi v1 from the projections on h1 to the projections on k such that the POVM can be written in this way. That should hopefully be familiar. Um, 
And um, now comes kind of a key definition. We want to have no disturbance, but not just for the original um, probability distributions, but for dilations. So uh, what does this mean? It's this definition here. We say that such a probability distribution mu satisfies no disturbance for dilations. If, first of all, I can write it this way, so there is some dilation, some large input space, and all the other ingredients. And then something else must be fulfilled, namely such that for all projections Q1 uh, in context E1, um, all contexts uh, of the first subsystem and all projections Q2 prime now on the bigger Hilbert space, this new um, uh, probability measure mu prime defined in this way satisfies no disturbance principle for all product contexts now in VFH1 tensor VK. This is the context category on the larger Hilbert space. Okay, this just means, okay, we have no disturbance now on the level of the PVMs on the level of uh, the larger Hilbert space. Um, these uh, intermediate states, it is mu v1 for every context v1 of the first subsystem. Um, they can be interpreted as states of incomplete information and they arise from a coarse graining of the ancillary degrees of freedom. Um, again, no disturbance is a non contextuality condition. And this is interesting because we get rid of the dependence on v1. You saw here, always, there's always an index. V1 involves still, so we had a dependence on the context uh, on the first subsystem, but um, we get rid of this by this condition. And this again uh, is interesting because it makes it possible to apply a stronger version of Gleason's theorem, which is due to um, bonds and right. And we can apply this now. Um, right, so we arrive at the following intermediate result. Again, we have two Hilbert spaces, finite dimensional, at least three dimensional, at least three dimensional we need because basically we want to be able to apply Gleason's theorem on each side separately. This is what already happened in Clay, um, Randall found this. Um, and we have such a mu that satisfies no disturbance for dilations. Then the sigma mu from this Randall um, found this uh, the Clay theorem has a particular form. Um, so this was sigma mu of a tensor b was of this form trace h2 phi mu a b. Now here is of course the part that comes from having a dilation. Um, but the key point is that the, the big phi mu here is what is called a Jordan homomorphism. What does this mean? Well, I have an algebra of observables and I can make this into a new kind of algebra, a Jordan algebra, by putting a different kind of multiplication on there. And this is basically just given by anti-commutators. The one half is a bit of a convention. Um, so this makes this into a commutative algebra, um, but it's not associative in general. And the Jordan homomorphism, of course, is a map between such algebras that preserves the anti-commutators or equivalently preserves this product, whether you have the one half or not, is not important. Okay, this is not quite enough. We actually want something that's a bit stronger than a Jordan homomorphism. We want uh, actual C star, uh, C star homomorphism. Now, our phi mu already is a Jordan homomorphism, and it becomes a C star homomorphism if and only if it also preserves commutators. Problem is that we are now talking about uh, Jordan algebras, and they don't have commutators because it's a commutative algebra. So nothing interesting can happen there. But there is a nice algebraic way of encoding commutators in this situation also. This goes back to Alfsen and Schulz. And, um, we like to call this time orientation. That how, not, not how they called it, but it's a nice physical interpretation. Um, you can act by conjugation in the way you might expect um, with one of these uh, operators exponentiated. And then of course, there's a bit of a choice where you put your plus and your minus. 
infinitesimally, if you just uh, take dy dt of this, you do get your commutators. Um, so this is how we encode this. Um, and this leads to the following definition. We say that such a probability measure mu preserves time orientations if the following holds well for all t, for all times, and for all a in this joint number of the first system, this here holds. It's basically, um, you can switch the, the, the phi mu with a time. Are in there somewhere and uh, for details you have to look at the paper the minus is correct it looks a bit weird at first sight the fine mu, of course is this jordan homomorphism we had before so if this jordan homomorphism is such that uh, we have additionally this condition here then we arrive at our main result and it's the following Again, we have two Hilbert spaces, at least three dimensional and finite dimensional overall. And we have a probability measure mu that preserves time orientations. And this means implicitly, it also satisfies no disturbance for dilations. Then this mu uniquely extends to a quantum state, sigma mu on the uh, Hilbert space of the uh, composite system. Um, so you get a proper state of the composite system from these conditions. And the sketch of the proof or the ideas are the following, even if you didn't follow um, what I said so far. These are the main ideas here. Mu satisfies no disturbance for dilations, means we can write phi mu in this form um, for some large interval space k, um, into which um, we can map h2. And this big phi mu here is a Jordan homomorphism. Then we also assume that mu preserves time orientations. This guarantees that the phi mu is not just a Jordan, but even a C star homomorphism. And then we can apply Steinspring's theorem, which namely says that if we have a C star homomorphism here, this guarantees that phi mu is completely positive. And then again, by choice theorem, to such a completely positive channel phi mu, there corresponds a positive state uh, rho mu. And it's exactly what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to show um, how we guarantee positivity of these things. So this is a slide I showed very early on. Um, now we have seen all these ingredients and we indeed uh, boil down to quantum states. Right, um, is a very short summary. We can classify quantum states within non-signaling correlations from the following three assumptions. First of all, locally quantum observables. Um, so what Alice and Bob can measure each separately is, is quantum in nature. Um, secondly, we have this node Terms for dilations, which is a slight upgrade of um, non signaling and it's a non contextuality condition. Um, and thirdly, this preservation of time orientations. Now it's important to say one thing that it's not really clear from what I said so far. This does not mean to pick some kind of global time direction. This notion of time orientations is an intrinsic and relative notion of time direction, basically. Alice can say which uh, direction time is forward for her, and Bob can say which time uh, direction is forward for him. And if they do this in a consistent way, then this condition of preservation of time orientations is fulfilled. They could also pick both the opposite, it would still work. So this does not fix any global time direction in any way. Um, Okay, so very brief outlook. Um, you can uh, consider these things also uh, uh, as generalizing Gleason's theorem to composite systems. Uh, there were some partial results known, but positivity was exactly what was missing. And you can go beyond the, the finite dimensional case. So this can actually be done on the level of phenomenal algebras. So this is also in a recent paper in the archive. Um, it also fits in in this discussion on what does contextuality actually 
mean and how much is encoded by contextuality in quantum theory and um, there's this this recent uh, paper sorry about that um, um, that shows uh, how much is actually encoded by contextuality in this sense um, and there's some very recent work by Marcus I don't think it's in the archive yet but very soon this also relates to uh, classification of entanglement in an interesting way. Um, and also these, these things with local time orientations, um, which I find rather intriguing. There are many open questions. Of course, we talk about composite systems in this setting and um, we characterize uh, some things that are normally a bit hard to characterize. Um, is there maybe a way to go a bit further to arrive at the categorical definition of a tensor product? Uh, what can we say about multipartite entanglement? Um, and just as keywords, what about quantum causal models? What about maybe space time ideas arising from entanglement? Um, so, um, as usual, there are more open questions at the end than in the beginning, but that's a good thing. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you. There is time for a quick question. Yes, John. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, I don't think you can see me, so I'm, I'm John van der Weitering. Um, I was just wondering about uh, the Jordan homomorphisms you find. I think you are working on a simple Jordan algebra, so mustn't this automatically be either a C star homomorphism or anti C star homomorphism, and you can't have any other option? Or um, does it only hold for your unital Jordan, uh, Jordan homomorphisms? Um, yes, in this finite dimensional case, where uh, it is, this is true, yes. Um, but still, you have to sort out which one. Okay, so this is where you get the statement that either it's, it goes time in one direction or goes time in the other direction? Because either you fix the homomorphism or um, you fix the anti homomorphism? Um, yes, it's, it's slightly more involved. These time orientations, basically there's a canonical time orientation um, if you have um, one of the, uh, you have such an algebra, L of H1, L of H2, and um, so we want to um, preserve the canonical one. Um, and um, here you actually have these two options only. And you're right, it's basically, whether I put the, the plus or the minus here, and then the opposite sign here. Um, this is exactly the, the choice you have in this case. It gets more interesting if your algebra is not just um, finite dimensional matrices anymore. If you have, for example, sums of matrix algebras, you can pick um, a time direction in each factor separately. All right, thanks. Uh, just a quick question. I'm wondering if these probability measures are at all related to the um, uh, measures on the spectral pre-shift that uh, we worked with previously. Um, oh, yes. Uh, hi, Carmen. Um, uh, yes, they are, of course. Um, so it's for this paper and this presentation, we kind of downplayed the whole contextuality aspect. We just used it as much as, as was needed. But um, this has a very natural home in, in terms of, of pre-sheaves and measures of pre-sheaves, of course. Um, the, the new aspect that um, is, is really harder than what we had before is that we talk about composite systems. And um, there, of course, um, you, the correlations between the two parts are interesting, and, and um, so this is what's the main focus here. Thank you. Okay, then let's thank our speaker again. So I think this is the session of substitute speakers. So David was originally going to be giving this talk um, until he put his passport through the washing machine. So. I, I had to stand in and I was hoping to give the talk in person, but I then picked up a, a positive COVID test this morning. So I'm now uh, doing this from my bed instead. It's an interesting experience doing a QPL talk from bed, but there we go. 
So let's let's crack on because I've got a lot to get through. I think um, so the main idea of this talk is that I want to think about um, dividing sort of the phenomena of quantum theory into sort of two different categories. Those are the sort of things that Lando was talking about in his talk, which have very actual classical explanations. So, so even things that we think intuitively are very weird about quantum theory, a lot of them turn out to have uh, simple classical models that can underpin them. On the other hand, there are some phenomena in quantum theory that can't be explained in this way, and so these constitute sort of rigorous proofs of non-classicality, normally formulated as no-go theorems. We want to find a, a nice way to make this dividing line and to understand this dividing line. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to take the point of view that the best notion of classical explainability, so the best way to draw this dividing line, is by determining whether for a particular phenomena or a particular scenario, whether there exists a non-contextual ontological model or not. And I'm not really going to go into the details of this, because one of the nice things that come out of uh, recent work that we've been doing is that there's an equivalent characterization of this idea in the language of GPTs. And so I'm going to present things in the language of GPTs, that's generalized probabilistic theories, because um, this gives a really nice geometric uh, way to understand things and has let us prove some interesting new results that I think are quite surprising that I will get to at the end. So, uh, classically explainable GPTs. So, as I alluded to, we've got this sort of connection between the idea that something admits one of these uh, generalized non-contextual ontological models and a particular property of a GPT, which is going to be the property called complex embeddability. And I'll now try and explain a little bit about what this is. But if you were at the tool session uh, yesterday, this is the same stuff that uh, Bell and Ellie were talking about there. But I'll go through it in, in some detail anyway. So they sort of commonly assumed that um, in the GPT framework that classical theories are described by simplices, or the state spaces, at least, are simplices, such as this triangle that we've got here on the left. And this is very natural because we can think of a simplex as really just being the space of classical probability distributions over some finite set. Um, and then on the, sort of the effect side, we want to assign probabilities to different states. And this means that sort of the most general way we can do this is by looking at the space of vectors in the dual space, which in this case is this cube. And in classical theory, these are like response functions for, for classical measurements. So it's sort of very natural to uh, view these things, these particular GPTs, as being classical GPTs. But we want to sort of weaken things a little bit and say, not just uh, look at what is strictly classical, but to also look at what has a natural classical explanation. So to do this, rather than just talking about uh, sort of the full simplicial theory, we also want to look at sub-theories and say that the sub-theories are also classically explained. In some here we can see that the blue faded region gives a subset of the states and a subset of the effects. And by virtue of being a subset, it means that they have this sort of classical explanation. Uh, they live inside the big classical theory. And so this, this is the sort of the notion of classical explainability that we want to put forward. That a, a GPT is classically explainable if it can be embedded into some sort of simplicial GPT or strictly classical GPTs. Uh, in a way that preserves all the stuff we'd expect. So it could be connect linear um, and it could preserve probabilities. And the, the classic example of one of these simplex embeddable GPTs is uh, the Speckham toy model. Or this is the same thing as what Lorenzo was talking about yesterday with his uh, toy field theory. Um, so the, the states in particular in these theories, just for the simplest system, is this sort of even of states that you can see here, and this embeds inside this text key. And you can do a similar hypercube. Are the same as the probabilities you get. You John, just, you, were, you were frozen for a moment. So we missed the last thing you said. Uh, okay, so, so, so I, uh, it's, should I go from this slide? 
Yeah, we heard that essentially this is uh, the canonical example of an embeddable GPTs, and you yeah, mentioned the range of That's basically all I wanted to say. This is like the classic example, and then I was rambling a bit, so I'll continue. <laughs> yeah, we, we have this sort, sort of uh, now we said that simplicial GPTs are those that are sort of strictly classical, whereas those that are simplex embeddable are classically explainable. And it turns out that this um, is exactly the same, this sort of notion of classical explainability of a GPT is exactly the same thing as Beckham's notion of generalized non-contextuality. Um, just a geometric spin, uh, spin on it. But now that we have characterized things in the language of GPTs, uh, we can use this and try and push it a little bit further. So we're going to introduce some new tools for studying GPTs and then see what they tell us about uh, classicality at the end of the day. Typically, GPTs are considered that the set of states and the set of effects are really the full set of things that are physically realizable in a theory. But usually when we're doing some experiment to try and look for contextuality, we just have a particular experiment. And so we want to have a sort of GPT-like characterization of a particular experimental scenario. And we call these things accessible GPT fragments. And roughly the idea is if we have some sort of preparation C with classical setting X, classical outcome A, then some setting that we do, uh, some system S that we're doing the experiment on, then some set of measurements indexed by Y with outcome B. Then we can look at the set of states, the set of effects within the full GPT that can be realized within this particular scenario. Set of states that can be realized look like this, this S on the right hand side. And the set of effects that can be realized in the experiment look like uh, this E that we have on the right hand side. And so we say that this sort of subset of the GPT is this thing called an accessible GPT fragment, and it's characterized by a subset of the states, a subset of the effects, and then it's got the same probability map and unit effect as the, the GPT started with. And these are very similar to GPTs. The, the main difference is that the states and effects no longer have to characterize one another, that is, they don't have to be drawn graphic for one another. And this is particularly the true if we end up in a situation where the states or the effects live in a lower dimensional subspace than the full GPT. And also we can have sort of subnormalized states um, which don't have a normalized counterpart within the fragment, although they will within the, the full GPT. And useful notion uh, for these uh, GPT fragments is the notion of cone equivalence. And this basically just says that um, Rather than looking at the full geometry of the state and the effect space, let's just look at the cones that they define. Um, and if the cones are equal, then we say that the two GPTs, the cone states are equal and the cone of effects are equal, then we say that these two GPT fragments are uh, cone equivalent. So there's a little example down here at the bottom. Uh, we've got two different effect spaces, E, and this one should be an E prime. And they're different convex sets, but if you look at the cones, they're the same cone. And this is a, just a 3D example of the same idea. We've got the, the gray bit, and we've got the uh, yellow bit. These are different convex sets, different convex sets of states. So they define the same cone of states. And, and these crop up in very natural scenarios. So if we have some scenario that we're trying to do, some target effects we're trying to realize in the experiment, but actually we have inefficient detectors, so sometimes they just happen not to fire, then this basically just gives us a new effect space where some of the effects are scaled down a bit. The cone is left invariant by this. So going from ideal to inefficient detectors uh, preserves sort of the cone equivalence class of the theory. Another nice example is this idea of flag complexifying a measurement. So basically, if you take some measurement defining a theory, and then we sort of bend the input around into an output, as you can see on the right hand side here, then this basically just uh, gives you a new measurement, which now has a single setting. Go to unary setting here and lots of outcomes. And this preserves again the cone of effects. It changes the precise geometry, but the cone stays invariant. Okay, so what does all of this mean for studying non classicality, for studying this notion of simplex embeddability? Well, we prove this theorem, which sort of underpins really all of our results, which says that if you have two accessible GPT fragments, G and G prime, and these are cone equivalent accessible GPT fragments, then either they are both uh, simplex embeddable or neither of them are. Uh, this should be a, a G prime here. So if, if two uh, accessible GPT fragments 
are in the same cone equivalence class, then we have the same sort of qualitative assessment of non-classicality for them. It could be that if we start to get into quantitative measures of non-classicality, then we start to see a difference between them. But at least on a qualitative level, just whether they're simplex embeddable or not, the, the assessment is the same. And I don't really have time to go into details about how this is proved. It's, it's not, uh, not a hugely complicated proof, though. Um, so have a look at the paper to see that. OK, so what does this theorem teach us? Well, let's go back to our examples again. So we said that if we have two scenarios, one that's got sort of these perfect detectors, and one of them has got very inefficient detectors, then these are cone equivalent scenarios. This tells us that if the original scenario with the ideal detectors is uh, not simplex embeddable, that is, it gives us sort of a proof of contextuality, then so too must be the scenario with the inefficient detectors. And this is true however inefficient you make them. As long as you have a non-zero efficiency, uh, then you keep this cone equivalence property. So this really tells us that there's no detection loophole in experimental tests of generalized contextuality. And this is quite surprising when you compare it uh, to, say, Bell's theorem, where uh, the detection loophole is, is a big problem. And you have to work very hard experimentally to uh, make sure you have sufficiently efficient detectors. This is not the case for generalized contextuality. Um, if we think about our flag convexified scenarios, so this is where we took the measurement uh, setting and turned it into an output, then again, we said that this gives a cone equivalent scenario. And so we can take any scenario that we want that shows uh, a proof of contextuality or proof that it can't be embedded in within a simplex. We flag convexify it and we end up with a new scenario that also can't be simplex embedded, so also as a proof of generalized contextuality. But this new scenario only has a single measurement. So in particular, if we've only got a single measurement in the scenario, then we definitely don't have any incompatibility in the scenario anymore. We've got a single measurement, so it's sort of trivially compatible with itself. So we don't need any incompatibility to see uh, generalized contextuality either. And similarly, if we've got no settings, then there's no need to have any sort of freedom of choice. There's nothing to choose, so uh, this is just becomes totally irrelevant. So again, we see kind of a, quite a stark distinction here between what's necessary in an experiment to see generalized contextuality versus what we know is needed for, say, uh, Bell non-locality or for Cochrane-Specker contextuality as well. OK, so this is basically the punchline that I wanted to get to. So let me conclude by just saying these sort of techniques that we've introduced, uh, this sort of geometric perspectives we've introduced for studying generalized contextuality, is not just sort of a, a, sort of a nice, um, well, it's a nice way to look at it, but also it has consequences. It allows us to prove new results and to in particular see that there are many examples where you wouldn't think to look for generalized contextuality, but actually you can find it. So without any incompatibility, without any freedom of choice, and without uh, needing efficient detectors. Okay, so I will finish there. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to have some So we've got time for a few questions. Uh, hello. Hi, John. Hello. Thank you for the nice talk. So about the uh, witnessing uh, contextuality without having compatible measurements, mm -hmm. does this have anything to do with like causal structures that we know that don't need settings to have a quantum classical gap, like the triangle scenario? Yeah, so that's a, a very good question. Um, the answer is yes, there is a connection to this, uh, but we haven't really fully fleshed out um, what the connection is. But um, in the particular example we looked at here, we don't need to have any sort of complicated causal structure. It's just the simple prepare measure scenario. But there's definitely uh, there's definitely some con conceptual connection between the two uh, that we yeah we haven't managed to make precise yet. But we would we would like to. Right. Great. Thank you. Thanks. 
Any other questions? Um, you went over it quickly, the particular slide, but there seemed to be a slight difference between inefficient effects and noisy effects. Ah, uh, yeah. Have uh, an implication for like practical robustness to noise. Yeah, so thank you for mentioning that because I've forgotten. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention this. So yeah, in in the, the sort of the contrast between what happens uh, when you look at inefficient detectors versus noisy detectors. In the inefficient case, you see that the effect scales down by a certain amount. It doesn't it stays the same. Whereas if you have sort of noisy detectors, then this sort of sinks the cone inwards, so it goes from something like that to something like that. And so this doesn't serve the sort of cone anymore. So this is not a cone equivalent TPT. And so if you add sufficient noise uh, to the experiment, then it turns out that there's always a certain threshold where you uh, become simplex embedded. Uh, so yeah, just adding sort of noise, you eventually will hit a point where everything looks classical, whereas adding inefficiency, uh, this, this never happens until you get to sort of zero efficiency. And so in fact, this is, this is what, um, what uh, Bell and Ellie were talking about yesterday in the tool session, that you can use this idea to give a robustness of uh, contextuality. So you can sort of measure how much noise do I have to add to my scenario before I become classical. OK, so I think it's time to thank our speaker again for this nice talk. OK, so hi for, for you, uh, those of you who don't know me. I'm Paolo Cavalcanti from ICTQT. And in this work I did with uh, John Selby, Jamie Sicora, and Bell Sands, we are talking about a way to um, parameterize nicely uh, no signaling channels in, uh, in, in, in GPTs. So to motivate the question or the problem that we are solving here, suppose that someone is interested in, st in studying no signaling channels for some purpose. So for example, this could be if you need to impose uh, the, the relativistic uh, causal structure. Then it can be useful in that scenario for you to have a nice parameterization of the no signaling channels. And this is what this work is about. So we will show that any no signaling channel in a locally tomographic theory can be decomposed as a affine sum of, of product channels. And in particular, this result holds for quantum theory because quantum theory is one of such a locally tomographic uh, GPTs. So this result generalizes results that are known for uh, classical uh, multipartite uh, stochastic maps and uh, for quantum maps in the bipartite uh, case. So to help you make sense of the question, I will provide a background in GPTs, no signaling channels, and in do, the dual tensor formalism that we use uh, to construct our proof. Then I will describe uh, the idea behind the, our strategy to make the proof, and just show you the main steps in proving the, the results. Then I will give you some final remarks. So to start the background in GPTs, uh, I will just go to quickly and say that in our notation, we represent uh, different system types by different wires in, in diagrams. And this difference in wires can come either in different labeling or in, the, in a different kind of uh, wire. For example, you can have a simple uh, uh, thin wire or you, you can have a thick uh, wire to say that these things are different kinds of systems. We represent processes as boxes with input wires uh, uh, underneath and, out, and output wires on top of it. States, because they are processes that have output in some uh, physical system, but they have trivial inputs. They are boxes that have no input wires. Effects, as the dual of the effects, they have input systems, but they have trivial outputs. And in particular, for each system, we define a special effect that is deterministic. And this uh, special effect in quantum theory translates to uh, the trace operation, for example. So because we will be uh, interested in causal GPTs, we have uh, additionally that the, the discarding effect in um, composite systems is just a par the parallel composition of the discarding effect of the single systems. Additionally, the GPTs, they have a convex structure, so we are uh, allowed to have summation of, uh, um, uh, of processes as long as the sums are convex. 
And using these uh, small elements, you can construct more complex diagrams by connecting the wires, as long as the type of wires matches. Match. So you cannot connect a wire of type, type A with a wire of type B. And in particular, when you construct a diagram that has no loose wires, these are the diagrams they are representing probabilities. So remember that the connections are only allowed when the types match. So I, in this uh, original statement of, the, of our result, I told you that we want to talk about locally tomographic theories. So first, what is tomography? Tomography is a notion of equality of processes that we can establish by looking at the probabilities that these processes can produce. So for example, here we will say that F and G, they are the same process, if and only if every time you substitute one for the other in a, in a diagram that is uh, representing a probability, you obtain the same probability. That means that F and G, they, they produce exactly the same probabilities in, all, in the same uh, scenarios. But in particular, tomography is called local tomography, when you can relax those diagrams that you're using to make the probabilities to be diagrams that have no side channels. And this a second um, condition is called local because it, uh, it uh, translates the meaning of making only local measurements in order to, uh, to establish the equality between the processes. So keeping in your mind that tomography is a notion of uh, equality of processes. Now about no signaling channels, we will say that a channel is discard preserving. If discarding your system after the application of the channel is the same as discarding it before. Um, and this notion is what we use to, de to uh, define uh, diam diagrammatically what is a no signaling channel. So as a channel lambda is no signaling, if itself it is uh, discard preserving, and every time that you discard a subset of its output uh, systems, you obtain a marginal lambda prime uh, um, um, channel on the systems that you didn't discard, that itself is also uh, discard preserving. So if you use this um, this conditional this condition in and try to use this channel to transmit information from one wire to the another wire, you see that this is impossible. That's why this uh, diagrammatic notion captures the idea of no signal. And finally, for our proof, we'll be writing many things using this uh, dual tensor formalism. And in, in this uh, formalism, when we want to represent, a, when, when we have a wire that represents a classical system, we will be drawing this wire in, um, in the horizontal, not in the vertical. And in particular, because this class, uh, these horizontal wires are classical, you can have a copy operation on, on them. And the process, the physical processes happening on these uh, classical wires, we represent by these white boxes. They have to be stochastic maps, or in your head, you can have that they are stochastic matrices. And, but we also will have, uh, we, we, we utilize mathematical, uh, mathematically well-defined uh, operations, but that are not physical. And we will, we will represent those by black boxes. So for instance, if you have a classical black box, this is a linear map that is not a, a stochastic matrix. matrix. So in this formalism, for each system type, you define a fiducia preparation, that is a process that has an output, a GPT process, and has a classical input, so you can control what you are preparing. And you define one fiducia such a preparation for each system. You similarly define a fiducia measurement for each system. And because these fiducia uh, preparations and measurements are informationally complete, even though they don't have physical inverses, inverses they have uh, mathematical inverses. And we will represent these mathematically well-defined but not physical inverses by using uh, the same symbols but in black instead of white. So we will have an inverse fiducial preparation, a inverse fiducial measurement, and uh, using those pieces we can construct a fiducial transition matrix, that is you have classical inputs and classical outputs, and you have the inverse of that uh, fiducial transition matrix represented as a, a black square, constructed from the inverses of preparations and measurements. So uh, detail that is important about all of those preparations, uh, 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 those pieces, is that all of them are discard preserving. So to recap this background, we will uh, be focusing on, on GPTs that satisfy local tomography, so you can define equality in this simple way. 
we'll be investigating no single channels. And for the writing of our results and proofs, we will be using this dual tensor formalism where we can have uh, this difference between uh, physical and non-physical encoded in the colors of the boxes. So the strategy to prove our result will be the following. It is known for classical stochastic channels that if this channel S is no signal, then you can write it as a affine combination of a product uh, classical channel. So you can use diagrammatic notation to encode this, uh, this affine combination part as a unphysical uh, state Q that is being distributed uh, by copy to the, to the um, uh, individual parties that have a, a product channel. So remember that this combination of product channels is an affine combination. So having this result in mind, you can note that the dual tensor formalism provides us with uh, the composition of any GPT uh, uh, identity channel that goes through classical systems. So we can use that the composition of the identity to decompose the wires of any uh, GPT channel that you uh, that we have. So take a GPT channel, you can apply the fiducial preparation and, and measurements to these wires, and then you have a, a stochastic map. And then applying the rest of the decomposition above, because it decomposes the identity, what you have back is again the original channel. So you go from GPT channels to stochastic maps and back, going through this unphysical uh, uh, mathematical operation. However, the composition of all of it is physical. And I, our idea is to use the classical result in this intermediate uh, step here, where we have the uh, classical stochastic map and then try to lift this result back into the GPT channel. So to in order to implement this, we start with a channel C, a, a GPT channel C that is no signal. And note that if it is no signal, when you map it into a, a classical stochastic map, the map that you uh, obtain is also no signal. It, and it is no signaling because the, the fiducial preparation me and measurements are discard preserving. So the... Um, the no signal condition pushes through the, the diagram. Uh, so if you just take the original no signal channel and decompose the identities, what you see in the middle of the diagram is the substochastic map, which we know, uh, on which we know we can apply the classical theorem. So that, that's what we do. We, uh, we, we rewrite this, in, this uh, part in the middle of the diagram as a affine combination of classical stochastic maps. And what we obtain is a affine combination of uh, product channels that, however, are not physical. If you look in closely what each of those black XI boxes are, they have these uh, black boxes inside, so you cannot guarantee that they are physical. So what we do next, because this is not yet the solution, we prove, prove the following theorem. Any discard preserving map uh, can be written as an affine combination of measure and prepare transformations. And any affine combination of measure and prepare uh, transformations is a discard preserving map. So you can write this in a compact form as just a equality between sets. The set of discard preserving maps equals the affine whole of the set of measure and prepare operators. So if you look at this X, you see that this X is discard preserving. So you can apply this theorem 4.1 uh, to write it as uh, an affine combination of a measure and prepare operations. And if you do that and just do some uh, algebra with the diagrams, you arrive at, at the result where we have lifted the result, uh, the classical result to the GPT channel. And this is our main result. Any no signaling GPT channel in a tomographically local GPT can be written as an affine um, combination of product chains, where I have used this unphysical, um, unphysical state there, just as a different way, a different notation for the affine combination. Uh, and in, it is interesting that in a GPT, such as quantum theory, where you can uh, reversibly encode classical information into the state, you can rewrite this uh, diagram above as just uh, a, 
separable operations happening on a shared uh, unphysical state, SQ, where this unphysical state is a affine combination of physical states. So for example, in the, in the case of quantum theory, this unphysical state would be a Hermitian matrix. So if you had uh, agents that can only do quantum operations, but they have uh, access to some Hermitian matrix, which is their shared state, they could uh, they would be able to realize any uh, no signal in, no signal in GPT channel uh, quantum channel. So uh, as in outlook of what we uh, we obtain, we know that now that for locally tomographic GPTs, not only for quantum theory, we have shown that uh, no signal in multipartite channels can be decomposed as affine combinations of product channels, and this is a generalization of results that were known only for multipartite classical and bipartite quantum channels. And we did so by lifting a result from the classical channels to the uh, GPT channels through this dual tensor formalism. So if you have your eyes on this uh, last remark, you can have a further question, which is the following. Since we just lifted this result um, almost for free from the classical channels to the GPT channels, we can ask ourselves whether how many results you can be lifting just by doing similar uh, operations. So if you think of any interesting properties of uh, classical stochastic maps, maybe it, it could be possible to do something similar and lift these results to GPT channels. And with this, I finish the preparation and thank you for attention. We've got time for maybe one quick question. Thanks for the talk. Um, do you know if local tomography is actually strictly necessary? Like, do you know if this condition fails in quantum theory on real Hilbert spaces or something like this? I don't know if it would fail, but for our proof, it is necessary. Mm. Yes. So it's an open question. Whether it's... Yes. Yes. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, so like right at the end, when you stated the theorem, you stated it in the kind of dual tensor form, and then you kind of stated it in maybe like a more familiar uh, process theoretic form. Mm -hmm. um, so like the result can be phrased in standard process theories. And so I'm wondering in your view, what, what like the main use of the dual tensor formalism is, is it for like conceptual clarity uh, or is it like doing some heavy lifting for you in the calculations i don't know if there is a deeper meaning but as i see it is it's just to provide clarity in the notation sure. because the classical systems they could very well be just vertical lines right and you could still encode the color in the boxes but as i see it it, it just provides clarity in, not in the notation when you are uh, constructing the proof great thank you so very good so let's thank Paolo again for the talk. Thank you.